All right, if you just watched the video on the electromagnetic radiation spectrum, you might be asking yourself, okay, why again are we looking at this? And the answer is because of the pretty colors. We've known for a long time that if you um, throw a sample of a particular type of compound, uh, a salt or an ionic compound into a flame, you get the pretty colors and we want to know why. And in order to know why different compounds are giving off different pretty colors, we have to understand electromagnetic radiation better because this is exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing electromagnetic radiation. Uh, if we take it one step further, let's look at the hydrogen spectrum. If I have a sample of hydrogen gas and I take that sample of hydrogen gas and for example I might trap it in a, a glass tube and I hook it up to some electricity that glass tube glows and it glows because of something that's going on with the hydrogen I see it glowing I see color it's it's kind of a pinkish color uh, because it is electromagnetic radiation being given off by that sample of hydrogen gas if I pass that light that's coming from the hydrogen gas and I separate it, I do not see a nice rainbow like we talked about in the last video. I see particular colors at particular wavelengths for that sample of hydrogen gas. And so scientists got curious because we're a curious bunch and said, okay, why do I see this purple line and this greenish blue line and this red line but nothing in between? And so they began trying to figure out what does the atom look like? What's going on in the atom that gives me those pretty colors? Now, at this point, this was the late 1800s, early 1900s when they were trying to figure this out. They knew that the basic atom had a nucleus which had the protons and the neutrons and somewhere outside the nucleus in this region of space there were electrons and they knew that the protons and neutrons were relatively small space compared to the electrons and so they they deduced from their knowledge of what an atom looks like that it must be something going on with the electrons that's giving us those pretty colors because the the protons and neutrons in the nucleus are, are pretty much immovable and you're not when you take a sample of hydrogen and shoot electricity through it and see a pink light it's still hydrogen and what makes hydrogen hydrogen is the nucleus not necessarily the electrons because you can get rid of the electron and hydrogen and still have hydrogen you just have a hydrogen ion rather than a hydrogen atom so they started focusing in on what's going on in the electrons that is causing these pretty pink colors from the last video we know that the pink color that we see which can be split up into the various wavelengths the wavelength times the frequency equals the speed of light for each of those wavelengths and that the energy associated with each wavelength is related to um, the frequency by this equation E equals H nu so they deduced that there must be some sort of change in energy because we're hooking it up to electricity after all some sort of change in energy of the electrons in the hydrogen atom are corresponding to particular frequencies which of course correspond to particular wavelengths which give us the particular line in the hydrogen spectrum and this was this this hydrogen spectrum is very well known I mean we, we, we always get the same we always get the same sort of colors when we look at that hydrogen spectrum we call that an emission spectrum because this energy is being given off by the hydrogen uh, in the form of electromagnetic radiation and these wavelengths are very fixed and very particular and so essentially what they did is they sat down and they started playing with the numbers to try to figure out what was going on and uh, a guy named Rydberg came up with an equation that fits very nicely with the lines that we see in the hydrogen atom and the Rid Rydberg equation looks like this the Rydberg equation works with hydrogen, the hydrogen spectrum. What this equation does is this gives us the wavelengths of the lines that we see when you plug in this constant, Rydberg's constant, you can look it up, it has units of 1 over wavelength, like 1 over meters or 1 over centimeters, you can find it both ways. And my N1 and my N2 
are whole number integers that just happen to work to give me lambda. And specifically, when n1 is the numerical value of 2 and n2 is the numerical value of 3, I see one of the lines in the spectrum of hydrogen. When n1 is the value of 2 and n2 is the value of 4, I see a second line in the spectrum of hydrogen. And when I plug in n2 equals 5, I see a third line and so on, just to the limits of my vision. And so this equation is called an empirical equation because it is based on figuring out from experiment what mathematical formula will give us those values. And that's exactly what he did. And everybody was like, oh my gosh, great, this works. Now we have to figure out why. What is going on in a hydrogen atom that would cause the wavelengths, which have a frequency associated with them and have an energy associated with them, what's going on in the atom that would give us this equation? Why would this equation fit for the atom. And, and they, again, there's lots of great minds getting together, thinking about this. This was before the internet, so they had lots of free time and trying to figure out what was going on. And one of the, the great minds figuring out at the time what was going on was Bohr. There was a man named Bohr, and he was looking at Rydberg's equation and what we knew about the atom, and he was trying to figure out what does an atom look like. And basically, Bohr came up with the idea that the hydrogen atom looks something like this. We have a nucleus at the center, and surrounding the nucleus in these orbits is a path of the electron. We'll label these orbits n equals 1 for the closest, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4 as we move further away and that as the electron spins around the nucleus along one of these orbits, it has a particular energy associated with them that could be calculated if I wanted to based on its position from the positive charges hanging on to it in the nucleus. If I shoot electricity through my atom, the electron will jump from one energy level to, a, oops, to another. Will jump from one energy level to a higher one if I, if I give it electricity, but then as the, the the natural state tends to be of lowest energy, and so that electron then is going to fall back down in energy. And as it falls back down in energy from one or higher orbit to a lower orbit, it will give off that amount of energy. We talked about that in the energy chapter. If you go down in energy, you've got to give it off. And if that energy that it gives off from falling from a higher energy level to a lower energy level, if that energy happens to correspond to a frequency which happens to correspond to a wavelength of visible light, we will see it. And those are the lines that we see. And the Balmer series, the Balmer series are the visible lines. And they fit the Rydberg equation when n1 equals 2, if we're talking about the electron always falling down to the n equals 2 level, uh, from, for example, the n equals 3 level. If I go from 3 down to 2, I will give off electromagnetic radiation of the exact energy needed to see a line at 656 nanometers, which is one of the lines in the hydrogen atom. If the electron falls down from the n equals 4 down to the n equals 2, that could happen. That would give me an energy of a second line I could see in the spectrum of the hydrogen atom. Now, if the electron were to fall down to n equals 1, the energy associated with any of those falls is not in the visible region. The energy associated with those energy changes, the energy associated with those changes in the orbits around the nucleus, are um, in a region of space that we cannot see. These are smaller wavelengths than visible light. They are in the ultraviolet region, and we can detect them with an ultraviolet detector. We just can't see them, and this is called the Lyman series. So Rydberg's equation works beautifully. It shows us the lines that we see in the visible region. It also predicts the lines that we could see in the ultraviolet, and, and these are in the infrared falling down to n equals 3. And it's fantastic, and everybody was so happy because now we know what an atom looks like. It has a nucleus, and the electrons are orbiting around the nucleus at these levels. We'll call them n equals 1, n equals 2, and so on. And everything was good except for it didn't work unless you were talking about hydrogen. 
It only works for hydrogen. So this picture, the Bohr model of the atom, is wrong. The Bohr model of the atom, there's something wrong with it. It doesn't work unless you're talking about hydrogen. And if it only works for hydrogen, it's not a very good model. So obviously we need something more. However, we still teach the Bohr model, and you saw all the links for the Bohr model of the atom, because it is an excellent starting place. It is an excellent way to start thinking about what's going on in an atom. It, it happens to be wrong, but it happens to have parts of it that we need to understand in order to be able to take it to the next level. And so then the next video, we will take it to the next level and fix the Bohr model of the atom. We'll fix it with experimental data, and we'll say, OK, now, now what do we think an atom looks like? Because the Bohr model is too simplistic. It doesn't work for anything besides hydrogen or, or one electron atoms. Once you get beyond one electron, it fails. And so we need to take it to the next step.